At first, I would like to mention that tonight is going to be your last opportunity to ask questions. And please, ask questions that are not a waste of time and energy for everybody. For you, for me, for everybody else. Those questions that concern other people, the universe, me, are a waste of time. The only questions which are useful and helpful are those that concern you yourself. And since you don't write your name underneath, and if you did, I wouldn't read it out anyway, you can ask anything that concerns yourself, either your meditation or your daily life or any problems that you see that you can't handle very well or that have arisen that now are new or any kind of insights that you may or may not have got. Only that is of any interest to you, the others, and me. Everything else are mental convolutions. The Buddha said, the whole of the universe, O oh monks, lies in this fathom-long body and mind. If you want to know something about the universe, get to know yourself. It's all in there. It's Anicca Dukkha Nata. And if you don't like Anicca Dukkha Nata, any one of the three, or all three, ask why that is the essence of the teaching. Say what goes on within you, not what goes on out there. And since tonight is your last chance to do that, and I'm of course referring to last night's questions, as you may have already fathomed, use the time. I may never be back in America. I may. I have no idea at this point. So if you want to know anything, do it properly. Do it with meaning and feeling. And then it helps everybody. You have a responsibility towards everyone else in this course and also one to me. We are all in this together. Your questions set the tone because I can only respond to what you're writing on the paper. So please remember that for tonight's question. We have discussed the first and second jhana. And I'm going to use the word jhana now because meditative absorption is long and cumbersome. And now you all know what jhana means. It's spelled J-H-A-N-A. And so we can dispense with that long and cumbersome translation, which is the correct translation, and just use this two-syllable word. makes it much easier. The same with the word dukkha. It's a two-syllable word that expresses everything. I have translated it, and that will have to do. So these are the two words, I think, in Pali, which are extremely helpful in the original language. Now first, just to recapitulate, blissful or delightful feeling. Second, joy inner joy. Jhanas are there not only to calm the mind and bring it to serenity, not only for purification, they have those two functions. Any concentration, any bliss and joy purify. The more often one does it, the purer the mind becomes doesn't get all that unwholesome thinking anymore. But they are there 
in the last essence to gain insight. And when we do jhanas, when we practice that way, insight should come and almost always does automatically. And I'm saying almost, there are always exceptions. So generalities are not always true. But it is very difficult not to gain an insight from having had a blissful sensation or inner joy strictly through concentration. It is very difficult not to realize that that all lives within and that we don't have to look out there for it. And we don't have to look at anybody else to give it to us. And we don't have to actually read a single book to find it. Although we can always naturally distract ourselves by reading books and gain more information and there's nothing to be said against it. I've written them myself, so I better not say anything against it. <laughs> but what we're really looking for, we've got it within. And that's the place to look for anything. If you can't get in there, you've got to keep on trying. This is where life is. It isn't out there. Those are only triggers and support systems to stay alive. That's all. Our real life goes on within ourselves, where we react, where we feel, where we emote, where we think we have problems. So even the first two jhanas have to bring insight. And we always do that at the end, not while. First, there has to be the experience. And after the experience, we can then understand the experience. So first we finish with the meditation and then we look. What was it? How did this go? In order to get to the third jhana, we deliberately let go of the joy. Sometimes people find that a bit difficult, particularly when they finally found it and isn't this nice and why now I have to let go of it. But that has to be recognized as attachment and also as a blockage for going any further. As you know and I have said, there are eight, eight absorptions. And sometimes the Buddha only teaches four because the fourth one is, so, so to say, the uh, springboard to get into the other four. But very often he mentions all eight. And even though they are mentioned in a very <coughs> succinct manner and without any great elaborations, if one hasn't done them, that mention in the scriptures is difficult to follow or understand. Letting go of the joy deliberately, but only after one has experienced it for some time. Now, I can't give any exact time schedule for those things, even though that is sometimes asked, because the time element changes completely when one is concentrated. You have all experienced that yourself, even though if you, even if you can't meditate yet. If we get interested in a book, we concentrate on it. We might read till three o'clock in the morning and be surprised when we look at the clock. If we talk to somebody who's very boring, after 10 minutes we think, oh my God, <laughs> this is taking far too long. So sometimes hours go by when we are really immersed and we don't know it that the hours have gone by. So other times, the time seems dragging. The same happens in meditation. If there's no concentration at all, one is liable to think that the one who's supposed to ring the gong has probably forgotten all about it. And if one is concentrated and the gong goes, one thinks, oh, can't be, I just started. And everything in between. So time 
is something that is depending on concentration. And it isn't actually what we have made with it, namely clocks with two hands and little dashes on it or numbers. That's only so that we meet at the appropriate times. Other times, time is within us. So it, I can't say stay in the joy for 15 or 20 minutes because you wouldn't have a clue that 20 minutes have gone by. If you're really immersed, absorption means to be immersed. However, one does know whether it's momentary or whether it takes a longer period of time to stay there. So one has to actually be able to stay with it for a period of time before one can deliberately let go of it and turn to the next step. The third jhana, in my translation, is contentment. It's often called something else. But this is the most predominant experience. Having found inner joy, there is no doubt that one is content. And contentment leads to a feeling of peacefulness. Now that is the experience in the third jhana, and that too becomes then the meditation subject. And having been able to stay with that, it's a feeling where the first and second jhana seem to be a little bit exciting and happening in an upper region, but that's only a feeling, they don't really. With the third jhana, one has the feeling that the concentration, the mind, has dropped down. It's gone further down. It's more of a settling, a foundation, something more, um, actually more fulfilling. And this is what happens with all the jhanas. They become more and more subtle in their emotional content and they become more and more fulfilling and they also bring more and more insight. If they don't, one is doing something wrong. The fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth are called vipassana jhanas, insight jhanas. And as we experience those, and I might explain that in a minute, insight is absolutely compulsory. Nobody can get away doing fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth jhana without gaining insight. It's impossible. One would have to be so dense that one couldn't even do the jhanas. So if the mind's alert and clear, it's got to do both. So third jhana, contentment. Because one has had what one wanted, inner joy. And from that you can see that everything is cause and effect. The cause, the first cause is concentration. So then we get the effect of blissful sensation. Blissful sensation is the cause for joy. Can't be helped. It's always. There's no way out of that reaction. Even if one wants to be miserable, one can't be. No way. And believe me, some people do want to be miserable. Maybe you've experienced it. It's another identification process. Look how miserable I am. And look at all the problems I've got. It's just another identification. But even if one would want to, if one has become, uh, has become able to get into the... Uh, blissful sensation, joy is the necessary effect. The joy is then the cause for being contented. And contentment is peaceful. So one needs to stay on that feeling. And so we can see that all the jhanas are concerned with our inner feeling. Now having been able to stay with the contented feeling, which is like a more solid foundation for our emotion and not at all exciting. 
but very calm. The insight that arises from that must arise, and it's got to be your own personal insight. I'm only mentioning it to point you in the right direction. But if you don't experience it yourself, it's not um, useful. The insight that arises from that is that there can only be contentment when there are no wishes. And at that moment, there are no wishes because the inner joy has been experienced to the point of filling one with it and one can't wish for anything. The mind doesn't have that um, emptiness in it. There hasn't got any place in it. Uh, any lack in it, any place where one can actually arouse wishes. It's not possible. Because one has been fulfilled and filled, not fulfilled, but filled with joy. So if the third jhana happens and you have contentment, which is peaceful, the insight which you have to look at at the end, at the very end, not while, but always at the end, whenever the meditation is finished, because of the gong having gone or the concentration having gone, then look at it and see, how could I be so contented? How could I be so peaceful? And only because there hasn't been a single wish. Nothing needed to be added and nothing needed to be subtracted. Everything was fine the way it was. Now, that insight should change one's reaction to one's own life, to the world around one. It should change, actually, one's priorities. Most people's priorities, and that includes practically everyone, are concerned with sense contact because most people don't know anything else. Seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling and thinking. What else could there be? So, having been totally contented because one has found within oneself that which one is looking for through the senses, then carries over into one's daily life Every time there is an unease within, every time there is a feeling of not being fulfilled, one realizes that it's only because one either wants to get something one doesn't have or wants to get rid of something that one does have. Eventually, that kind of understanding becomes habitual. And looking at it, one sees it's totally unnecessary. It's the most used way of making ourselves unhappy. Obviously, we think we're going to get happy if we get rid of what we don't want and get what we want. And for a single moment, we may actually feel successful. Look, I've done it. And what's with the next moment then? a new one arises, a new wish, a new lack, something that one wants or doesn't want. So it's a surefire way of being restless, unfulfilled, distraught, irritable, all those things that we all know only too well. But having had the experience of being absolutely contented, absolutely feeling that there's nothing that we need in addition to what we have can bring one back again and again, not only to that understanding, but also to that reaction. So maybe you can see from that why the Buddha so strenuously recommended, if you have read that piece I've hung up there, to do the jhana because it changes one's inner being, and in order to gain access to Nibbana, we have to change our inner being. We can't access that. 
with the way we are. Because maybe we want it because we haven't got it. Or maybe we don't want it because we don't know what it is. Well, none of that helps us at all. So in order to even get access to anything approaching spiritual evolution, we have to change the inner being. The more often we sit, the more often we get concentrated, the more of the purification takes place. The first three jhanas are easy to do. They are, so to say, the bottom end of, con of Sama Samadhi, of right concentration. And most people who are serious about their practice and are not rummaging around in their own opinions and views can do them. Those two exceptions. If you're not serious about the practice or rummaging around in own views and opinions, obviously one can't do it. But the seriousness of the practice also is different in the time element. And that's a karmic resultant. If one has done that in the past life, it goes very quick. Or life. If one has never done this before, it seems like an enormous achievement and one has doubts whether one can do it. Those doubts are detrimental to practice. There's nothing to doubt. There's only, again, a mental convolution. Just do it. There's nothing to achieve. There's only to let go. When we let go, that's an act. That's not a passivity. Letting go of something is action, mental action in this case. Physical action, you know, if you want to let go of something, you have to do physical action. But even mental, you have to do mental action. Letting go. Having been here now for one week, the world has not intruded as much as it usually does. You've only allowed it to intrude in your thoughts. It has not actually intruded in its usual way by being physically present. Finally, let go of it. The world gets along without you beautifully. Nobody's been clamoring why you aren't there. In fact, most people of the six billion that live on this planet don't have a clue that you're of whether you're there or not. So let them be. Let them be, let the world be. They're letting you be also. Your circumstances allowed you to be here. Take advantage of that. Now comes a much more difficult jhana. This one is far more difficult because the observer has to shrink to minute size. The first three have a solid observer there. You can easily afterwards say the first one was such and such a sensation, the second one was joyful, and the third one was content or peaceful. You can easily say that because you've got a full-size observer there. That full-size observer is the last stronghold of the ego. And it hangs on to it for all it's worth. But in the, to get into the fourth jhana, that observer is still there. But it has to shrink. Otherwise one can't get in. Now, I like to compare third and fourth jhana to a well. You're sitting on the edge of the well, let your feet dangle in, and come down into the well just a little bit. It becomes very quiet, and you feel quite alone there, and that's third jhana. And there's a feeling of being encased in peacefulness. But if you want to get to fourth jhana, you get to get down that well, much further down. And so fourth jhana actually has the um, characteristic 
of being quite different at different times. Sometimes you can get, can get down into that well a little bit. Sometimes you can get to the bottom. Proper fourth jhana is being at the bottom of that well, where nothing at all happens except stillness. Now, if you don't like the picture of a well, if you feel a little bit claustrophobic about it, think of the ocean. First, you wade into the ocean, and the water touches you up to your neck, and you're immersed in that. And you let yourself go into that water and just be contented to be there. And then you dive under the waves and you're totally covered by the water. And there's nothing except stillness. Now to do that, obviously the me has to go very far into the background, which I was calling the observer. And the stillness and the peace has to be right in front, has to be the main aspect of what's happening. And coming out of it, the understanding, the insight that comes from that is that real peace, real stillness, complete peacefulness is only possible if the me does not take pride of place. Which is a very important insight, I've mentioned it before, but it only works if you experience it yourself. And because it's difficult to get into fourth jhana, it is difficult for that one reason only, to put the me at the very end of everything. Not me getting into fourth jhana. Not look at me, no hands or something like that. <laughs> but just letting everything be. Needless to say that it is a most exalting experience, a very beautiful experience, and one that is a market change of consciousness. All the other three that I have been explaining are also changes of consciousness, obviously, because they are happening within. We are not dependent on any outer condition, which is a, an important understanding. Neither bliss nor joy nor contentment are dependent upon outer conditions. They're strictly dependent upon letting go and being concentrated and not trying to explain to oneself why or why not <coughs> this is useful or not useful, but just to get in there and do it. Letting go is the key word for all spiritual progress. It's exactly the opposite of the material life in the world. In the material life in the world, progress is supposed to be becoming, getting. Getting more knowledge, getting more money, getting more important, becoming famous. All sorts of things that are adding to one's own size. In the spiritual life, it's diminishing that size. Some people don't like that at all. Well, they can't live the spiritual life. It's very simple. It's so simple that one wonders why people still have difficulty understanding that. Diminishing one's own size is a great pleasure. But one has to try it out in order to know it. Same goes for fourth jhana. That's a market change of consciousness. The first three, of course, are two. The, uh, the change that takes place in the fourth jhana is one that changes the mind continuum even in daily living. And that's why 
there's no question that if one can do it, one should be doing that every day. The um, results of insight are indestructible. The results of samadhi are easily lost. If one doesn't continue doing it, they disappear. And many, many people, I can't say numbers, but many, can do it in a course and never again. And then, of course, they come to another course, which is, of course, sensible. But it shouldn't, it needn't happen. You can compare the, um, the mind that can do the jhanas with the body that can do yoga exercises. If you practice a while yoga, you can stretch your muscles, your tendons, your sinews, everything gets stretched. And you can actually do things that you weren't able to do before. Let's say you can touch your toes now, or you can bend backward. And then you stop doing yoga for six months. And you've got to start all over again, stretching the same muscles, the same tendons, exactly the same with the samadhi in the mind. The Buddha calls a mind that can do it, the jhanas, being malleable, soft and pliable. If you don't do it, it hardens up again. The harder the mind, the less able it is to do anything. Hardness arises out of egocentricity and exaggerated fear. Both contribute to the hardness of mind. The jhanas soften it. If you don't do it, if you stop doing it, obviously, it will all shrink together again. The Buddha also calls it a shrunken mind or an expansive mind. Quite easy to see when you think of yoga exercises. So the fourth jhana gives a, an ability to the mind to really let go. And having done that, one can carry that into daily living. Everybody's confronted at one time or another, practically every day, if one isn't, that's been a very lucky day, with some unpleasantness. <coughs> In one's own mind, mind you. The weather can be beautiful, people are all quiet, the, the food is wonderful, and still, the mind is still not peaceful and still and contented because it doesn't even know how to do it. It hasn't done it. So if it doesn't know how to do it, how can it ever get there? Having done third and fourth jhana, it knows what it's like, and it can revert to it, not to the extent that when we sit in meditation, but certainly to some extent. So all of the experiences in the meditation carry over and must carry over into daily life, otherwise we're meditating in vain. Our daily life is the one that takes up most of our time. And if that isn't being used in the same way that we use our meditation time, which takes usually up the least of our time, we're doing it for nothing. And it is an actually, one can say, it's an automatic response. The mind that can become totally peaceful, totally still, is able to do that and has done it over and over again, of course, not just once. But many times, such a mind can do it at any time. So all of the experiences in the first four jhanas carry over into daily life. There's a simile given in the commentaries, the Sudhi Magan, of what the jhanas um, depict. The simile given is that a person is walking through the desert and is getting extremely thirsty. In fact, the thirst is on the point where the person might collapse. 
And then that person sees in the distance a little pond. And seeing that pond, his energies renew and he draws nearer. Now that thirst depicts our longing for fulfillment, our search for inner peace and happiness. And some people don't know they've got it. They think the world is doing what it ought to do. They're, it thinks, they think that they're getting what they are looking for and they don't feel that inner disquiet. When one comes to meditation, one would assume that most people have done so because they felt that inner disquiet. They felt that there was something missing, that there must be something else in life other than the things that the world offers. Not everybody feels that or knows that they're feeling it, but most people would. So that's a thirst, very thirsty. And then first jhana is that pond that they see and energies are renewed. Interest is aroused, a feeling of bliss arises because there's a promise there that fulfillment may come. And then that person draws nearer to that pond and stands at the edge. And joy arises from the fact that the person knows, I've got here what I've been looking for. And it's very joyful. And all the um, tiredness and lack of energy has disappeared. And then that person steps into the pond and drinks to his or her heart's content. Contentment, getting what one wants. It is the drinking of that nourishment that the inner life was looking for. So there's contentment. And then the person steps out of that pond and goes to the nearest shade tree, lies under it, and takes a rest. Is totally peaceful. No thoughts, nothing, just peace. This is a simile used for the first four jhanas. And I think we can, if we have felt our inner discontent, our inner lack of being fulfilled, our lack of completeness, and our have felt our search for perfection, then we can identify with those similes. The fourth jhana is a springboard for the next four. And I will explain those, even though that might not be at all applicable, but at least it will give you an idea what they are about. They may not at all be applicable because the concentration may not be anywhere near there, but quite a few can do them. And so we'll see what the Buddha had to say about them. The fourth jhana has a feeling as if one is going down. That's why I'm using the simile of the well. It's as if one is going down into something, into the depth, to the depth of what one can still perceive. It's like the depth of perception. And one can say that it is um, as if we if we see a, a painting that has no perspective, it looks rather flat. If it has the depth of perspective, it becomes alive. So this is the same here. This goes into a depth of perspective and it comes alive. And so what does it do for us? It generates enormous mental energy. The sloth and torpor are no longer 
at all a topic. A person who can do third, but mainly fourth, gains enormous mental energy. And of course, together with the mental energy is the sharpening of the mind. Now, this mental energy that we gain from the uh, third and fourth, I should say, but mostly fourth, is like a renewal. Now, when we sleep at night, the body gains new energy, but the mind doesn't have a chance. Just the body. So, the jhanas are the way of gaining new energy for the mind. And since our mind is constantly at work, it's the one that's in charge of our life. It needs a fair bit of energy. And only if it does have that energy can it begin to see things as they really are. Primarily, we start out by seeing ourselves as we really are. And if we don't like what we see, well, we can always change that. We can always change ourselves. But to dislike it, we see something that is not wholesome and then dislike it, just makes things twice as bad. Why not just see it and do something about it? So with the mental energy that we gain from having had the mind really at rest, at peace, we can see things clearly. And seeing ourselves clearly, we see the world clearly. As we have gone down into the force, it's a feeling, I mean, it's just a feeling. It's not going anywhere. It just has that feeling of depth. Coming out of it, there's a feeling of coming up. And the fifth meditative absorption is called infinity of space. Now we come now to four absorptions, four jhanas, which have absolutely no connection to our usual perceptions. The first four are called the fine, uh, the rupa jhanas, the fine material absorption because they have a connection. We know what it is to be joyful. We even know what it is to be somewhat peaceful, even though not that kind of peace. And we have a connection. But when we now come to the ah rupa jhanas, which are the formless jhanas, or the non-material jhanas, that has absolutely no connection to any state of consciousness, consciousness that we have known before. The only danger is that if we should do them, not to think that we're somebody special. Nobody is anything special. We just are here, that's all. And if we can't do them, or any of them, we also shouldn't think we're somebody special that is getting the short end of the stick. Nothing like it. It's a karmic resultant, how long it takes till we get in there. And it's also a karmic resultant, how much resistance we have to learning something new. That's also a karmic resultant. But we can't just sit there and think, well, it's a karmic resultant, okay. <laughs> it's a very um, much used uh, expression, well, it's just his karma, or it's just my karma. That would be destiny or fate. And the Buddha said, there is no such thing. There is karma. But we make new karma every single moment with our thoughts. So if you're not watching what you're thinking and don't know that you're becoming negative, try again. You've got to know because you're making bad karma if you're having negative thoughts. Even though you're not aware of it, look at them to the extent of analyzing them, taking them apart. Why am I thinking what I'm thinking? 
Why do I think I can't do them and therefore I'm of a lesser breed or therefore what is being taught I don't want to know or I've got to think of something else because then I can find that that what the Buddha taught isn't right or something of that nature. Look at the bad karma that you'd be making with all that. So we're neither something special when we can do it nor are we something special when we can't do it. We are a living phenomena of mind and body. And all we can do is do our very best. And let the results take care of themselves. That's all anybody can do. So no ideas about mental activity. They extend our horizon to unknown width and depth and change our whole perception of what the world is all about and particularly change our perception of what is important. When we change our perception of what is important, things start to fall into place and life becomes much easier. Again, I want to mention that while the jhanas do just that, they are not enlightenment. But as the Buddha says in that particular sutta that I've hung up there, they are the pathway to. So if you haven't read it or have forgotten what it says there, read it. They're the pathway to enlightenment. If one takes that pathway or not, that's a second question. But they are an automatic enrichment of one's own mind continuum, of one's own mind ability, and an automatic enrichment of insight, where the grossest and worst thinking mistakes can no longer happen. Sure, we can still make mistakes. Anyone who's not fully enlightened makes mistakes, which is quite all right. But the worst of it is somewhat ironed out because one can't experience the infinity of space and then still think that one can accomplish anything by being negative. It just isn't possible. The infinity of space, that kind of experience, cannot be had and renewed with a negative mind. And one can't come out of it and think, well, I'm going to really tell that person off. It's just impossible. <laughs> it can't be done. Or I'm going to tell them what I think. As long as one only hears about it or reads about it, sure, one can tell them what one thinks. But when one experiences it, it's impossible. I can't do it. So, the fifth jhana is called the infinity of space. Well, not having done it, the name means nothing. Space, very nice. The word spaciousness is being bandied about everywhere. And uh, infinity, well, yes, we had something like that when we went to school in mathematics. It was totally ununderstandable. But the experience of it is a totally different matter. It's got nothing to do with spaciousness or mathematics. From a practical standpoint, in order to get in there, the Buddha recommended this. One can, if one is really an um, accomplished meditator, one can use the quite faint boundaries of the body after the fourth and extend from there further and further and further until the feeling of infinity has arisen. The body, the personal body, has disappeared, but with it all bodies have disappeared. Anything that is material or solid has form, everything has disappeared. There is only space. 
some people don't like to get into it. Why? Because they're attached to this body and person. So attached that they're afraid they could lose it in that infinity of space. Well, yes, one loses it while one is in that meditation, but you can have it right back when you come out of it. So there's no need to be afraid of anything. And if one does it once, it doesn't really change one's perception totally. But if we do it regularly, it stays with our mind continuum. It has an effect on the mind because we realize that those things that we are so concerned with, do I look all right? Is that other person nice? Does she or he like me? Am I being asked to do things I don't want to do? Am I having all the responses that I'm looking for? All the things that we are so concerned with, they all fall by the wayside. It doesn't matter. Because the infinity of space hasn't got anybody in it. Now, that doesn't mean that we have come, and I would like to emphasize this again, that we have come to letting go of our me delusion. All it means is that we have had an experience which will undoubtedly lead us there if we continue to practice and if we know why we're practicing and if we have an idea that practice is the only thing that will make any difference. But having had that experience of the infinity of space more than once, just once, it's in the beginning one gets this wrong idea that it could be detrimental to one's ego. Well, it is detrimental to one's ego, but not immediately. It takes a few times of repetition, and then it becomes very detrimental to one's ego. And as it becomes detrimental to one's ego, one recognizes the relief that brings that with it. I like to compare that to being extremely fat and trying to go through a narrow door. And if the body is extremely fat and tries to go through a narrow door, it will hit both sides of the door and feel either uncomfortable or painful. If our ego is extremely fat, we'll hit all other egos. And that's uncomfortable and painful. If we shrink that a little, just like getting thinner to get through that door, we don't hurt it so often. And this is what happens. As we go along on this path, we don't lose the ego illusion right then and there. We've got to do more than that than just doing the jhanas. But they are extremely effective in shrinking the size of the ego. And thereby, shrinking the size of the ego, we also shrink all the opportunities we have of getting hurt, hit, feeling hurt, or hurting others. In other words, life becomes much easier because there are less wishes and less attachments and less ways and means of trying to be somebody. So one way is just to go to the outer edges of the body as we can still discern it at that time. It's not a solid outer edge after the fourth, but we can still discern it and move from there. But the Buddha also gave another um, help in to get to the infinity of space. And that is, if we can't just do it easily like that, to go from the outer edges of one's body to the size of the room, the outer edges of the room, then to the outer edges of the house, the outer edges of the village, to the forest around, to the outer edges of the forest, 
to the outer edges of the horizon and the sky and then moving from the sky beyond the horizon. So in other words, take intermediate steps to get to that feeling. Again, if we haven't done the first four, getting into the fifth one is an accident and usually not repeatable. So one, two, three, four, nicely one after the other. Having done the fourth one, then to get into the fifth one is actually a natural progression. Some people feel that it's difficult to do. Some find it very easy. When you do in this, um, with these intermediate steps, you can see that these are actually a way of imagining that there is a village, a forest, the horizon. And if you're at all visually inclined, you can see it. If you're not visually inclined, at least you can think it. And as you think further and further, eventually the feeling of that also arises. A feeling is a very peaceful one because nothing happens in the infinity of space. It just is. It's um, peaceful and also it brings a great insight because when you come out of it, you know from your own experience that your body was not there. And nobody else's body either, nor were there any stars or any clouds or anything at all that you could point to and say, well, I'll have that one. Nothing. Nothing at all. And not being able to point to anything and say, I'll have that one, obviously brings about an understanding that all the things that we want to have are sheer illusion. They are nothing but made up ideas. Now we do need certain support systems to live. We need food, we need clothing, a roof over our heads and medicine for the body when it's sick. Those are what the Buddha calls the four requisites. But all the other stuff that we fill our houses with and that are so cumbersome because one has to keep them in order, clean them, repair them and so forth. They are sheer illusion that they are needed. They are strictly another support system for the me. And in the infinity of space, when one has actually experienced it, we can see it's all totally unnecessary. We're just burdening ourselves with things and ideas which have nothing to do with absolute truth. They are all only applicable to relative truth. Relative truth based on me. I'm having this. I am being this and I'm going to become this. And I want it. Or oh, I don't want it. So the insight which arises from the infinity of space is one which is quite profound and you can't help but get it. Because that experience shows you a different world. It's not flying off into space. When you come back, you're just the way you were before. And it's not imagination. It's a feeling. All jhanas are feelings. Enlightenment is a feeling. Not being enlightened is a feeling. As you feel yourself being there, that's a feeling. That's not being enlightened. As you feel yourself not being there, no me within the whole frame of body and mind, it's a feeling, enlightenment. But enlightenment only when it always is like that. The um, next one, the sixth one, is the infinity of consciousness. And just as one can change one's direction from the first jhana of delightful sensation to the joy which accompanies it, 
and then be in the second jhana, just so one can change one's direction from experiencing the infinity of space to the consciousness which experiences that. And the consciousness which experiences infinity of space has to be infinite. Ordinary consciousness cannot possibly experience infinity of space. So we can just make a switch if we can. An accomplished meditator can. But accomplished means usually years and years and years and years of practice and karmic results, which we cannot ascertain. But also patience, determination, and perseverance. Anyone who doesn't have those three cannot really meditate properly. It's going to be a sort of um, in-between measure between meditation and not meditation. So from the infinity of space, if we just switch over to the sixth one, the infinity of consciousness, we become aware of the fact that only an infinite consciousness can be aware of an infinite space. However, if we can't do it that way, we can also take measures to help ourselves. We can go to what we will think is the seat of consciousness. And most people think that right here is the seat of consciousness. It isn't. But... If one thinks it, then it's there where one thinks it is. If you put your attention on your right big toe, which you can do, I'm sure, anybody can, then your seat of consciousness at that time is in the right big toe. But we usually identify our seat of consciousness with being not even in the mind, but in the brain. That's fine doesn't matter where we think it is. It's much easier to spread out from here than it is from the big toe. So we go to that seat of consciousness and we spread out from there and do exactly the same thing that we did before with the exception, the difference, that we now put our attention on being conscious and not anymore our attention on seeing the material form. At first we were, to get to infinity of space, we were interested in seeing the material form. The material form of first the body, then the house, then the village, then the trees, then the horizon and the sky, and on further. Now we become aware of being conscious of all that. So we again take those intermediate steps and become conscious of the fact that first we are conscious of the limitation of this body. And then we spread out the conscious of the room, the house, the village, the trees, the forest, the horizon, the sky. And as we get as far as the sky, then we become conscious of embracing space at, as we had experienced it. The infinity of consciousness embraces the infinity of space. So these are intermediate steps which we can take if we can't just switch over. The infinity of consciousness gives an even stronger understanding of the non-existence of this personal self. Because even if we have already made some headway with not identifying with this body, and intellectually everybody knows I'm not the body, I'm much more than that. But feelingly, practically nobody knows. But if we have already made some headway, headway with letting go of the identification with this body and therefore with also finding in space no body, we certainly are still beset with the identification of our mind. The observer, the knower, the consciousness, the awareness, whatever you like to call it, doesn't matter. It's all one and the same. So when we experience the 
infinity of that, where there's absolutely no personal consciousness to be found. It's just as large as space and further and further. That gives a very strong indication that we have been thinking in the wrong way because of the personal experience. If you have the personal experience, nobody can argue it out of you. If you haven't got a personal experience, you're thinking things up. And as we think things up, we have viewpoints and opinions. And the Buddha said, also in, in many suttas, but in the Ma Mangala Sutta, that an enlightened one has no viewpoints and opinions, only experiences. So beware of viewpoints and opinions. Everybody who's not enlightened has got so many of them that they drown the experiences. And when we have so many viewpoints and opinions, we can't have any experiences, we can't go anywhere. That's it. We're stuck. We're drowned. So here we have an experience which is totally different from anything that we've ever experienced before, unless we've been doing this, and if it's the first time. And it gives rise to the understanding to the insight that there is cosmic consciousness, universal consciousness. Mind you, it's got nothing to do with enlightenment, it's just steps on the way. Eh? This understanding of universal consciousness generates a feeling of responsibility. I've mentioned it before, I'll mention it again at this time. The feeling of responsibility towards universal consciousness, the more often you think negatively, angry, the, um, feeling resistance, trying to tell somebody off, the more of that you let go into universal consciousness. The responsibility we all have, if we can only become aware of it, is to have the purity of consciousness so that more people have access to that. We only have access to that which is already within us. It's like an echo. We get the echo from the universal consciousness. But if we throw out the negative things, and of course the echo that comes back is even more negative. Sounds dreadful. So one of the things that help us to know how negative we've been how unpleasant we've been are also the reactions of our surroundings to us, of the people that we're with. If they react in a way which we think is awful, check what you've been doing to generate such a reaction. Don't become more negative. All of that becomes absolutely and totally clear when you see the infinity of consciousness. Experience it. The infinity of consciousness is there. Sixth jhana. It's available to everyone. But you need patience, perseverance and determination. Three very nice characteristics. But they also need to be um, imbued with love of what you're doing. If there's no love, then the strongest determination is going to result only in a feeling of I must, I'm supposed to, I ought to, and that doesn't work. But if you love it, you can actually fall into it. I think if you can get to six jhana, that's plenty. We we'll let seven and eight go and I'll just say a few words about path and fruit. Path movement is called Magga, M-A-G-G-A, and fruit movement is called Pala, P-H-A-L-A. And they're usually mentioned together, Magga Pala, because they occur together, or in such quick succession that one can say they occur together. 
they are not an intellectual happening. They are not something that we can bring about by wanting it. They are something that we can bring about through practice. But also, they are something that we can direct ourselves to. We can take that direction. But if we haven't taken the preceding steps, nothing happens. Nothing at all. And since most people really would like the results without doing the work for them, nothing happens. There has to be, first of all, a purification of heart and mind, of the emotions and of the thoughts. And if you haven't done it, it's useless to even think about path and fruit. It's useless to even think about the jhanas. First, there has to be purity. The purity is the underlying foundation, the sila, the conduct, the behavior, what we put out, the way we emanate our inner being. If that isn't pure, and you can follow as many rules and regulations as you wish, if there isn't any purity within the thoughts and the emotions, it doesn't work. The purity of thought and emotion that is the main way of finding the foundation for the path. Having done that to the extent that it becomes, or that our behavior becomes extremely manageable. I'm not saying perfect. I'm saying manageable. So that most of the time, there are no accidents, neither emotional accidents nor mental accidents. And everybody knows those accidents. They are very often considered to be the fault of the other person. I mean, they should be looking where they're going. But actually, every accident that happens to us, we have made happen ourselves. So when we have become imbued with that purity, though that the accidents are very, very minor and very minute, then the concentration has a chance. And when the concentration has become so that we can go at least to fours, possibly five and six, we can take a stab at path and fruit. Now the Buddha said that we can experience path and fruit after any of the jhanas. But from experience, I would say that four, five, and six are the ideal ones, seven also, but they are extremely calm and have nothing in them, and therefore they give one the best starting point. So in order to direct oneself towards path and food, and I'm only talking about it because somebody asked it, it's um, probably not applicable at all at this point in time, but uh, not to worry. Hopefully, we'll all still be around quite a while and can practice. One needs to, in, after the jhana, one needs to investigate, after having coming out, what one is attached to, what one doesn't want to let go. Now, it may be oneself. It may be another person. It may be the hope for a longer life or a long life. It may be the idea that me is really somebody and that I should prove it. It can be anything. Whatever it is that we are most attached to, we need to bring up. People that have children are usually most attached to their children. People without children find other things to be attached to. It, it really doesn't matter. If we let go of one thing, we always find another. So seeing that attachment clearly may make, may make it possible to understand that this attachment is not useful, not fulfilling, does not bring about peace and joy, does not have anything in it which really is important. It may bring about exactly the opposite. It may bring about the reaction, of course I'm attached and I'm going to stay attached. That's fine. Nobody is forcing anybody to become very wise. 
One can do whatever one pleases. If the mind says, of course I'm attached and I'm going to stay attached, that's fine. Nothing further is necessary. But if the mind says, this attachment is useless, I don't want it. All I want is absolute peace. All I want is absolute understanding. Then one can try to let go of that very important, the most important attachment and let go of everything that has anything to do with oneself, which is primarily oneself. Let go of the whole thing. And be immersed in the knowledge and the understanding that there isn't anybody there. And then the mind may actually open up, let go, and that particular moment, is only one mind moment, the past moment, is something that can't be described because there's no observer. There's nobody there to describe it. The next moment, immediately after that, is a fruit moment, and that can be described. And the fruit moment is one which is usually described by everybody in the same way, and therefore one can tell whether it's happened or not. It's an enormous relief. It's like letting go of a heavy burden, very often tears of joy, and afterwards a feeling of not being quite stable because one has jumped across an enormous abyss and hasn't actually found one's stability yet. One is still a little bit wonky, but that doesn't last long. And the results of the past moments are something that one has to ascertain oneself. The onus of the experience and the result lies with oneself. That's why I've been mentioning and telling and uh, suggesting and explaining. Use your own wisdom. Everybody's got it. Don't think that, like as if you were in a university where the whole thing is being handed to you on pieces of paper and all you have to do is learn it by heart and then you know it. This isn't like that at all. It's got nothing to do with it. This is a self-recognition aspect and a self-working um, course. It has nothing to do with being handed things on a platter. All you're getting from the Buddha are directions. He called himself the shower of the way. And if you don't go along that way, you won't see a thing. It's all hidden. So the fruit moment which comes immediately after, being of a total relief, can be tears of joy, a lightness, blissful, not to be um, misunderstood uh, or compared with the jhanas, the jhanas are also blissful, but the fruit moment has a different quality. It has within it embedded the knowing that something vital has changed. And that is the one that you have to ascertain yourself. The first past moment brings about right view of self which doesn't mean that we are constantly without that mistaken view of self, namely this is me, but then we put our mind on it, we realize that self is just an idea. It also brings about enormous gratitude to the Buddha and commitment to the Buddha's teaching because the result is something beyond all uh, reckoning. The splendor and the grandeur of the teaching of the Dhamma comes to life. Skeptical doubt is eliminated because one has experienced it oneself. So the more skeptical doubt one has at the moment, the more one should be patient with that and say, wait, maybe things will change. Because nothing changes without practice. Every problem that you could possibly have or think up, and we are all thinking them up, disappears when the practice has taken hold. 
So problems are not really something that we need to deal with unless we have no way of quieting the mind even for a moment. The fruit moment changes what is called the lineage. One is no longer a worldling, so it's, that word is used, but one belongs to the noble, the noble people, an Aryan. Aryan is a noble one. And a worldling is a putijana. Because having crossed that threshold from being of worldly opinions, one has had the experience of the transcendental, of the otherworldly. So not because that <clears throat> one has been able to be in the jhana, that doesn't cross the threshold, but it enables one to get to that threshold. And if we get to the threshold, it's entirely up to us whether we'll step across it or not. And the person who has done this for the first time is called a stream entrer, Satapana. And the occasion is called stream entry, Satapati in Pali. And it is irreversible. And the scriptures say that you can only be reborn seven times which is consoling anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but a stream enter from personal experience, usually, having heard the accounts, usually is absolutely determined to get further because he's had a, he or she's had a taste of what it's like to be without a me. And it's so grandiose and so wonderful that it's not enough to just know it. They want to feel it all the time. And in order to feel it all the time, one has to become at least a non-returner, which means two more paths and fruit moments. So there is an urgency of practice, the urgency which is also irreversible. And if one doesn't get any further, one is born as a stream enter. And whether the person knows it or not, they, at a very young age, usually get to the teaching. Whether they can then do the other steps, who knows? They've got seven lifetimes to do with it. Also it is said that a stream enter can never break any of the five precepts. We'll deal with the five precepts tomorrow. And also it is said that if a stream enterer has had that experience because of the Buddha's teaching, can't take anyone else as a teacher except the Buddha. That is not to say that this experience is only possible for people who follow the Buddha, not at all. This experience is possible for anyone who takes spiritual practice and spiritual life seriously. The only difference is that the Buddha has given exact guidelines and explanations. That's the only difference. People of all faith and denominations, spiritual practices have been able to do this. How many, how often, I don't know. But numbers of them. But if one has done it because of the Buddha's teaching, one stays with the Buddha. One can't go anywhere else. It's impossible. Because the love and the gratitude is so strong. If you can hear this, you will see that even having had this enormous experience, hate and greed are not even touched. Now, what to say about the ordinary worldling, the rest of the world? Can you see from that that we should never be surprised that the world is as it is? We should never feel any sadness about it or any aversion to it. 
That's the way it is. Any worldling has hate and greed. We have the opposite, but those we have too. And even having had the first experience of the no-self, in that past moment, and the result in the fruit moment, even then, hate and greed are not touched. However, one can say safely that a person who has now right view of self, the more often they put their attention on that right view, the less hate and greed will arise. Hate and greed is still sitting in there, just like the jack is sitting in the box. But it will not come out as much and as often as it does otherwise. Some people are beset by hate. It comes out all the time, even in the smallest uh, or, um, situation and occasion. And some people are beset by greed, that comes out all the time. But when one has had that first experience, by putting one's mind on the understanding one has of oneself, it gets lessened. And another thing that is done, belongs to the practice, is that after the jhanas, any one of them, wherever one gets to, one resurrects the fruit moment as often as one remembers. One can resurrect the fruit moment in daily life. It's only a second that one needs to look. And that resurrection is a great purification. The thing that is the stumbling block, the obstacle, are our identifications and attachments. And another stumbling block is, of course, the uncertainty whether one really wants to be enlightened. Has one ever inquired into oneself? Or is one just interested in meditation to have life a little more pleasant as it goes along? Or is one just interested in the Buddha's teaching because it's something else to know? Or what does one really want? If one wants, the path as a personal purification, there's no reason why one can't do it. None whatsoever. But one does need to investigate oneself very minutely. And only oneself can change oneself. There's nobody that can do it. Even the Buddha couldn't have done it. Couldn't have changed anybody if that person didn't want it. So we have the explanation of six jhanas and path and fruit, which are the goals of this practice. Whether we reach that goal or not doesn't matter. One has to know whether one is on that pathway because of it or whether one is on that pathway just to have things a little more pleasant. Everybody can choose. We are entirely at liberty to choose whatever we wish. But if we wish only to have things a little more pleasant, obviously we're not going to try very hard. So whatever it is that we want out of life, whatever our priorities are, write down this is the first day of the rest of my life. What am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Starting today. What's at the top of the list? Write it down and then look at it again next week and see whether it's still the same. And then a week after. And then look again. And it may change completely. Maybe today you write down enlightenment. And next week, if you're like, well, what's that? Can't remember. <laughs> I don't really want that. I want a better job. <laughs> well, check it out. Do it yourself. This whole thing is a do-it-yourself do scheme. And I think that's why it is most appealing, because it's do-it-yourself. But as you do it yourself, watch out for your karma. 
Watch out for your thoughts. Watch out for your emotions. Don't make, or uh, make as little bad karma as possible. We all make it. Only the Arahant doesn't. But we can do, minimize it and life will be so much easier.